Good morning, welcome to Four Wheels in the Seat. My name is Alex Dalrymple, and this is the channel where you can see a new car reviewed every week. But to make sure you don't miss one, hit the subscribe button down below. And if you like what you see, give me a like as well. Today I am in the Mitsubishi Pajero Sport GLS. And the Pajero Sport actually was the very first car I reviewed on this channel nearly three years ago. If you wanna go back and have a look at that review, you can just by clicking the link up there. And as my daughter would say, Dad, it's a little bit cringe. I like to think I've improved my reviews a little bit in the last few years. So the Pajero Sport has not really changed since I last reviewed it back in 2020, and there is a new model on the way. Mitsubishi tell me it will be here sometime soon. So I thought maybe it was a good time to have a last look at this model. This mid-spec GLS model, I would say, is probably aimed mostly at governments and fleet buyers because it doesn't have quite the level of touchy-feely stuff or gadgets that, you, that uh, you'd want in a family car, and it's also only two-wheel drive, so you're not doing any hardcore off-roading in this. But it does have a 3,000 kilogram brake towing capacity, so if you've got a horse float or a boat, this could be the SUV for you, although I would probably think it would be better as a second car rather than your daily driver. Mitsubishi's design language uh, has evolved a little bit since this car came out. It's, if anything, become just a little bit sleeker. But uh, this car still looks really, really good, especially at the front. But the uh, a rather attractive front end in this car is covered by a bull bar, or nudge bar as I think they like to call them these days. This alloy one is a $4,168 option, so not exactly cheap and probably not something worth getting unless you absolutely really need it. But it does have fog lights built in as well as indicators and it looks mean. From the side you can see just how big this car is and how high it rides up. There is a massive amount of clearance there. but. As I said before, it's only two wheel drive, so you're not going up the side of a mountain in this car, but should you need to drive over a canyon, well, you could probably do that. At the back, we've got a tow bar added on. That's a $1,495 option. In fact, there's thousands of dollars worth of factory fitted options you can get on this car at the Mitsubishi website. You can really up spec it to the nth degree, which is actually quite impressive. Underneath the powered tailgate, where you have a, an okay size boot, it's only 504 litres or 131 with the third row of seating up. Uh, the spare tyre actually sits underneath the chassis. Underneath the bonnet we've got a 2.4 litre diesel engine which outputs 133 kilowatts of power and 430 newton metres of torque. Average fuel economy comes in at 8 litres per 100 kilometres and power is sent to the rear wheels only via an eight-speed automatic transmission. Inside and the interior is a bit gray and a bit plasticky, but it's functional and easy to keep clean, but you know, this isn't a luxury car. The center console screen is eight inches and I'm, to be honest, not a fan of this software at all um, because it's quite old and pretty much does nothing and I like systems that do lots of stuff. So here we've got a very paired back system that just has uh, native navigation, which is all right, AM, FM radio, plus digital radio, and that's about it. It doesn't do too much more than that. Um, look, there is an argument for simplicity and a lot of people like that. Not for me personally, but each to their own. The uh, picture from the one camera on this car, which is at the back, is kind of low resolution. But if you're after a bit more functionality, you can plug in with a USB cable and use wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Climate controls underneath that, pretty easy to use and straightforward. We've got some USB inputs and an HDMI input. So I assume you can plug in a DVD player or something and watch it on the screen, which is a pretty handy feature. I haven't tried that myself. Then we've got a little tray that's just a bit too small to store my phone, and my phone's not particularly big. So there's no wireless charging, but the USBs are right above it. Big gear shifter here, which can be flicked over to the left to put it into manual mode and change gears manually, as there are no paddle shifters on this steering wheel. Little storage tray there, a couple of uh, cup holders, and a, a pretty good size center console bin with a removable tray. The instrument cluster is digital analog hybrid and this little screen in between the two big analog dials there 
is pretty old. It actually dates back to around about 2009 and the Mitsubishi Lancer that came out that year. And look, unfortunately, the one thing I really don't like about it is that there is no digital display for your speed which pretty much every car has now. So you are relying just on the analog dial, which is less accurate for your speed. And the information on it, uh, on this screen in the middle is pretty basic. It's sort of average trip information and average fuel consumption, that kind of thing. It's nothing to get too excited about. Again, like the rest of the tech in this car, it's pretty straightforward and bare bones. The seats are cloth and to be honest, they don't feel extremely durable and being that cars like this usually have a fairly hard life, I don't know how long this material is actually going to last. So if you are thinking about getting one of these, I'd seriously consider putting seat covers on it or uh, going for a higher spec model and getting leather. And it's the same material used here on the door inserts as well. Again, it's nice and soft, but it just, I don't know how long that would last. I think you'd wear through that fairly quickly. The seats are manual, there's no electric adjustment except for the driver's lumbar support. That's pretty much it, the rest you've got to do by hand. Seating position is really up high and I mean everything about this car rides up high. So you've got a really good view over the front here to the uh, front of the enormous bonnet which is even bigger still with the bull bar on the front so it just goes on forever but you can see the front of it really really clearly. You've got great view all around here, even through the rear vision mirror at the back there you can see quite a bit and the wing mirrors are nice and large as well. But there is no blind spot monitoring in this car, so you've got to rely on your eyes for that. How old school? Backseat passengers fare pretty well. There is a load of room back there and a 240 volt power outlet as well, which you can plug any device you like into, which is great if you're going camping. A couple of USB-A ports back there as well. And air vents are actually in the ceiling, which I actually really like because, I mean, that's where sweat tends to come out first. And as I get further and further into my middle age years, there's more and more sweat to deal with. So good to know. The third row is predictably tiny and probably best for small children on a short trip. So what's it like to drive? Well, um, yeah, it's big. It feels big in every dimension. Um, it's actually not that wide. It's much longer than it is wider. The proportions are a little bit strange. The uh, proper normal Pajero, which is now out of production, was sort of a bit wider and this is narrower. So you do get a little bit of a sensation that you don't want to perhaps take corners too quickly because not that you worry it's going to tip, but there is a fair bit of body roll. One thing I have noticed that this car does is that after you've been stopped at the lights for about 20 seconds or so, there'll just be this really brief little shudder through the whole car, just like it's settling down for a moment. It's sort of like when your child has been crying and had a tantrum and then they quieten down for a moment and do one last <gasps> It's like it's doing that, weird. So this car sits on the same chassis as the Mitsubishi Triton Ute, which means that for all intents and purposes, it's a truck with an SUV body. And with the diesel engine rumbling away and just the overall ride and feel, it, it is more truck-like than sort of, you know, SUV that you'd be comfortably dropping the kids off at school in every morning. With its truck-like suspension and high ride height, it does cruise over potholes and speed humps beautifully. In fact, probably better than just about any other car you can imagine. The list of safety gear in this car is probably not quite as extensive as some others, but look, I mean, it does everything it needs to do. So there is hill descent control, emergency stop signal function, and forward collision mitigation. But as I mentioned before, there's no blind spot uh, warning, and there's also no rear cross traffic alert, things like that that are missing. But as you can hear, there was that forward collision mitigation going off, uh, advising me to brake. It does go off a little bit prematurely sometimes. The Mitsubishi Pajero Sport GLS is a good SUV, but it's not for everyone. Its lack of creature comforts and tech will probably be a bit of a turnoff for most families. And if you're serious about going off-roading, you won't want this because it's not four-wheel drive. But it does tow a lot and it's very simple to use and it seats seven people. So if that's what you're after, then this could be the SUV for you.